On September 15, 1950, after only a month of planning, a team of United States and South Korean forces landed at the port of Incheon, only 100 miles south of the 38th parallel and just 25 miles from the capital city of Seoul. Over the course of one week, 75,000 troops and 261 naval vessels dispatched by the United Nations set out to battle the North Korean People's Army. While the location was criticized as being far too risky for its changing tides and unpredictable weather, United Nations Supreme Commander Douglas MacArthur was confident the plan would succeed. In a daring operation planned and executed under extremely difficult conditions, the United Nations forces aimed to reverse the tide of the Korean War, seize control of Seoul, and solidify America's post-war reputation on the global stage. United Nations Intervention On June 25, 1950, close to 100,000 North Korean People's Army troops invaded South Korea in a coordinated general attack along the 38th parallel, the line dividing Communist North Korea from the non-Communist Republic of Korea. The sudden attack threw the South Korean forces completely off guard, forcing them into a hasty retreat. Two days later, United States President Harry S. Truman announced America's intervention in the conflict. By June 28th, the United Nations approved the use of force against North Korea. After the UN Security Council recommended that all forces sent to Korea be led by an American, General Douglas MacArthur, who rose to fame and admiration in the Pacific theater of World War II, was appointed. Throughout the summer, South Korea suffered a relentless series of attacks, even as United Nations allies scrambled to come to their aid. Pushed beyond their limits, and despite shortages of food, weapons, equipment, and soldiers, the South Koreans kept their morale high and mustered enough supplies to allow for one more large-scale offensive. By early August, American and South Korean forces had successfully established the Pusan perimeter, which followed the Naktong River and protected the critical southern port of Pusan. This perimeter enabled the U.S. and South Korea to thwart North Korea's attempts to unify Korea under one pro-Soviet Union government. As reinforcements and supplies poured through the port, the world looked on in astonishment, wondering if the formidable American forces that had vanquished the Germans and Japanese just a few years prior were now at risk of being pushed into the sea. The General From the moment he assumed command, MacArthur thought about landing behind enemy lines. On August 12th, he ordered his staff to prepare for an amphibious landing at Incheon, a port city in northwestern South Korea, bordering Seoul. While planning and preparation for such a significant amphibious operation usually took about six months, MacArthur only had one, with September 15th as the target date, the earliest the tides would permit. However, in Washington, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were initially reluctant. They feared that the limited resources they had, combined with the restricted time frame, would make it difficult to establish an effective plan. Some even doubted that Incheon was the right place for a landing, as the tidal variations at the beach line only allowed for a six-hour window suitable for an operation of this scope. As United States Navy Commander R.D.G. Capps noted, quote, he drew up a list of every natural and geographic handicap, and Incheon had them all. The only viable approach to this vital port was through a narrow and torturous channel blocked by Wolmi Island, a key harbor defense site, as the port facilities of Incheon were inadequate for such a major operation. However, MacArthur persisted, fully aware that the entire Korean People's Army, North Korea's military force, was already committed to the assaults in Busan, leaving Incheon poorly defended. The port outlet was where North Korean lines of communications were at their most vulnerable. MacArthur paid particular attention to Incheon, as Seoul, South Korea's capital, held significant psychological importance in potentially turning the tide of the war. The military leader was confident there would be no danger to the precarious Pusan perimeter if he had a marine division to spearhead the assault. Chromite Finally, the Joint Chiefs of Staff put all their hopes into MacArthur's plan and greenlit the Incheon Landing, codenamed Operation Chromite. For the core of his landing force, MacArthur selected the 1st Marine Division, a skeleton force brought up to strength by activating Marine Reserves and stripping another division of men and equipment, and the 7th Infantry Division, strengthened by Korean fillers and American soldiers shipped from the mainland. As planning progressed, 
The force also incorporated two additional South Korean Marine Battalions, an elite Republic of Korea Army Infantry Regiment, and an assortment of support troops from the Army and Marine Corps. The massive force of men willing to take over Seoul through Incheon was designated the X Corps, and placed under the command of Major General Edward Almond, who served as MacArthur's Chief of Staff. The landing force then became part of Joint Task Force 7, directed by Vice Admiral Arthur D. Struble, the Navy's 7th Fleet Commander. Surprise Attack A week before the main attack, a team of guerrillas was deployed in Incheon. The group, codenamed Trudy Jackson, collaborated with locals to relay intelligence back to the United States forces regarding tides, mudflats, seawalls, and enemy fortifications. When the North Koreans learned about the Allied agents in the peninsula, they sent an attack vessel. However, she was swiftly sunk by the Americans. Additional drills and tests were then conducted on coasts with similar conditions to perfect the timing and performance of the landing craft. Finally, on September 13, 1950, Joint Task Force 7 initiated their offensive against Incheon, battering North Korean fortifications, coastal artillery batteries, and supply points for two straight days with destroyers, cruisers, and carrier-based aircraft squadrons. Two days later, the lead elements of the U.S. X Corps hit Green Beach, located on the northern side of Wolmido Island. This landing force consisted of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, and nine M26 Pershing tanks from the 1st Tank Battalion, some equipped with flamethrowers or bulldozer blades. The North Korean People's Army had wrongly assumed that the main invasion would happen at Quinsan, and war planners only diverted a small force towards Incheon. Soon after the landing, UN troops recovered documents written by North Korean leader Kim Il-sung, in which he stated, quote, The original plan was to end the war in a month. We could not stamp out four American divisions. We were taken by surprise when United Nations troops and the American Air Force and Navy moved in. By noon, the entire island was captured. According to General MacArthur's personal memoirs, the Navy and Marines never shone more brightly than at Incheon. Realizing their major blunder, the North Koreans then sent six columns of T-34 tanks toward the beachhead, half of which were destroyed by F-4U Corsair squadrons. A further counterattack by M-26 Pershing tanks destroyed what was left of the North Korean armored division in the area, clearing the way for the capture of Incheon. Things were looking up for the UN and American forces. Advancing Inland On September 19th, the United States Army Corps of Engineers repaired a local railroad extending up to eight miles inland. That same day, the crucial Kimpo airstrip was captured. Transport aircraft began delivering gasoline and ordnance for all the vehicles stationed at Incheon, while the Marines continued unloading supplies and reinforcements. United States Army troops then advanced from the beachhead and rendezvoused with their comrades, advancing north from the Pusan perimeter. On September 22nd, the Marines entered Seoul, only to find it heavily fortified. By then, UN forces had unloaded 6,629 vehicles and 53,882 troops, along with an outstanding 25,512 tons of supplies. In contrast to the swift victory at Incheon, the advance into Seoul was slow and fraught with severe losses. Moreover, the NKPA attempted to stall the United Nations offensive to allow time to reinforce the capital by withdrawing troops from the south. Despite warning that seizing Seoul would enable the remaining North Korean forces in the south to escape, General MacArthur felt compelled to honor his promise to the South Korean authorities to retake the capital on September 25th, exactly three months after the beginning of the war. Eager to pronounce the conquest of Seoul, on September 25th, General Allman declared the city liberated, even though Marines were still engaged in house-to-house -house combat. Free Seoul The following day, Seoul fell to the Marines. The North Korean People's Army, completely shattered, had ceased to exist as a cohesive force. While many of its survivors escaped northward through the wild country in the central and eastern parts of the peninsula, more than 125,000 prisoners were taken into the custody of the United Nations Command. The execution of a daring amphibious landing at Incheon reversed the war's course entirely. Most military scholars today consider the Battle of Incheon as one of the most decisive military operations in modern warfare, while commentators have described the operation as MacArthur's greatest success and a bright example of military genius. 
The astonishment created by the unexpected appearance of the brave and daring ex-corps in Chun added even more luster to MacArthur's already brilliant career. Thank you for watching our video. Please subscribe to Dark Docs, and make sure to check out the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels for many more epic true stories from the World Wars and the impressive military equipment that made them possible. Also, don't forget to leave a like and activate the bell icon to be notified of our newest content. Stay tuned.